Say again the name. Almaya. Maya, Maya but. But Leah. Leah or Leah. Leah. She goes by Leah. She goes by Leah. Okay. It is my son's story. I'm sending it to the South African um, group. They're all gathered for. Okay. Oh, coffee, would you like Yes, please. Thanks. Does everybody know that this guy got sentenced? Did that just come in now? Yeah. No, what? A soldier? He did? To how much? 16 months. 16 months, okay. 18. Okay, that's not bad. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been principal. Like people were taught it could have been 16 years. God forbid. Seriously, you don't know anything with the courts. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody on Facebook and the live, and anybody who's here. So we're going to do today some things that we haven't done yet, which I've been promising for a long time, to see what he actually says in Chovot uh, Alevavot, in Duties of the Heart, which is in a Musar book, really, from the 14th century, from Rabbeinu Bechaye, and is the probably the most important source in terms of understanding uh, what, it, what it means to trust in God, what it means to have confidence in God. The Rebbe had always, always sent people to Shara Bitochon, it's called the Shara of Bitochon, the Gate of Trust. So we can't learn it all. It's a very long piece, the seven, the the Gate of Bitochon. I believe it's the fourth gate, and so it's too long for us to read everything. But I wanted to take a sampling out of it today, which is what I photocopied for you. Uh, you can share. You get to share. And, but before we do that, before we do that, so I want to wrap up one point that we started discussing many times over, but we never actually said it. We said that the person who had the most bitachon um, after of, of, this, of the ten martyrs was Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion. We, we, we talked about this a lot. So, so we said that he was trying to bring the Mashiach by force, by saying Hashem's name. And it was in spite of the Romans who had decreed that nobody can uh, learn Torah. And eventually he paid with his life. And we said that he was a Gilgal, he was a Tikkun already of Yiftach HaGiladi, that we learned about Yiftach a lot. And that Yiftach is the example of a person who uses a vow, a Shavuah, in order to borrow from the future. And to be able to perform something now, except that he did it in an unrectified way, because when the time came... It turned out that his daughter was the first uh, person to greet him. And so he had to sacrifice her. And he was not willing to go back on his, on his netter, on his, on, his, on his vow. And you can, even his name, Iftach, uh, indicates that you can open the vow. Why? Because he never intended it for it to be that way. In any case, Rabbi Chanin ben Taradion is a Gilgal, a re- reincarnation of Iftach Giladi. And his wife was a reincarnation of of um, of Iftach's wife, and they had two daughters. The one daughter, um, the one daughter, was the reincarnation of Iftach's um, uh, daughter. And this time she did live. It was a little difficult, but she did live in the end. And the other was Bruria, the famous Bruria, who was Rabbi Meir's wife. And about Bruria, we have to say something more. Bruria herself 
is considered to be by the Arizal a reincarnation of Osnat, Yosef's wife. Now if you remember, we took Yosef as an example, maybe the example in all of the... I don't need it this time. Um, maybe the example of somebody who had trust in God, bitachon ba'ashem, and, would, and followed through with his vision. He never gave up on it. So, Buria, in a certain sense, being that she's osnat, and Rabbi Meir, and this is an important thing that we don't have time to get into right now, but there's a pair of Chachamim in, uh, in the Gemara that even though they're uh, 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 a teacher and a student, they're the most instrumental in bringing about how to have the type of bitachon that you can when there's no temple. We talked about Rebbe Akiva last time. The other Chacham that we won't have time to talk about now is Rabbi Meir. That's Rabbi Meir who married Bruria. And he was a student? So Rabbi Meir was Rebbe Akiva's student. He was one of his, of his five great students in the south. Originally, Rabbi Akiva was apparently in... Uh, in, uh, when it says he was in Beit Lechem, it doesn't mean Beit Lechem here in near Yerushalayim. It's Beit Lechem Aglilit in the Galil. So there's something to be learned from their relationship between both Yosef and Osnat and between Rabbi Meir and Bruria. And again, Buria is, is, a, is a second incarnation of Osnat. So she's already more rectified. There's something about her that's more rectified than was with Osnat. Osnat was born how? She was Dina's daughter. That's how Chazal somehow they figure it out. That she was Dina's daughter who was also somehow adopted. She was an adopted daughter of Potiphera and his wife because they were sterile, they couldn't have children, so they adopted her at some point, it's not clear how they got to her again. But that's, a, that's how it's uh, understood. So she was, the do- she was ostracized from Yaakov's family, because she was the daughter of Shechem, who had raped D- Dina. So there was something wrong with that whole uh, situation. So she didn't find her place in Yaakov's family, and she eventually ended up in Egypt, and she was taken in, by Potiphar and his wife, and then later she is who married um, Yosef. But the second Gilgo is now Rabbi Meir and Osnat. Okay? As, as, Mary, yeah. Rabbi Meir and Buria. Okay? Now, in both of them, you already see that there's a lot of light. So Rabbi Meir is full of light. Meir Enei Chachamim says that that's why they called him Rabbi Meir, because he enlightened the eyes of the other sages. And Bruria, her name, comes from, from the word to clarify, the Vareo. So she's an emit Bruria, she's like a, a very clear truth. But what we learn from their relationship, and the fact that they came back twice in the same capacity, is that the trust is a masculine trait, and the Muna, faith, is a feminine trait. Now, as I was coming here, I, I, it suddenly hit me that this is one of the great ways to disarm people's, uh, call it, suspicion against these categories of masculine and feminine. Because the whole world now is going some kind of, undergoing some kind of change where people can't uh, relate to the old, uh, the old uh, system. Well, so I don't want to say the sexual. Sexual is a physical thing, but in terms of identity, there's a whole thing. It's, you call it feminism, you call it whatever you want. The Arizal calls it the rising of the nukva, the rising of the feminine. Right? And he has, you know, 500 years. The Arizal, 500 years ago, he writes that this is one of the most... He basically write this, he writes that all of history is a succession of, of rising and falling, ebbing and flowing of the feminine in reality. 
So the original meaning that he ascribed to it was not about men and women at all. He meant it in terms of the light and the vessels. Okay? That the light is the masculine and the feminine is the vessels. He doesn't write it out as male and female at all. He calls it, there's just chura and nukva. They're even in Aramaic to keep you away from this whole thing called uh, maybe uh, male and female. But like I said, he also understands it as the passing of history, as historical change having to do with this. So what the Rav writes here at the end is that really the way to look at this today is that we're all the masculine. We, we mentioned this in, in many ways if you, you know, over, over the classes that we've had. But that each one of us, relative to something that we'll discuss in a moment, we're all male, we're all masculine in the sense that we have to have the trust, the bitachon. And we talked about it as reality, right? We said a few times that I have to bring out what reality ha- has, but we didn't, we didn't really um, ex- explain what reality was in this whole story. So reality is the feminine. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it. That it's like I'm inseminating reality with my dream. Who, we? Who Each one of us. Masculine. We're the masculine. The human being has a dream, has a vision. We call it a vision of faith. But it's fueled and it moves down from being faith into being will, into being thought, and into being eyesight, into something that I see in reality through our trust. So really in us it's a process of yesod, it's a process of the, of the foundation, it's a process of trust that moves us from faith into seeing what our vision was enacted in reality. What about reality itself? It's the feminine here. What does it experience? It experiences faith. Where did it get its faith from? From God creating the world. To say it another way, reality is the new female. And everybody is, every human being is a male in that sense. I don't know if you remember this, but once we, we must have talked about it because I love this thing so much. That what do women say if you daven with a Chabad sitter? What do you say when you come to Shelo Asanisha? Right? Well, I, I learned from Rabbi Bork and the Rebbe's Rav that it's better. You don't say anything. Say anything. Right. But if someone will feel bad, they could say what's traditionally told to say. Right. Feel so what's traditionally said? It's traditionally said, traditionally, that's the problem, is Shasani Kiltono, that he created me according to his will. But the problem with that is that, we, that this is not a bracha from, from the time of the Talmud. This is a new t- bracha. You could say this is a reform, the first, <laughs> the first reform act in Yiddishkeit, which was like being feminist. Okay? It was like the feminism of the time was that in the 16th century they added this bracha, this blessing, that they made me according to his will. But that's not from the sages. The sages didn't think about this at all. I was happy to have one second less time of saying, I say right. one second and say bracha, what is it? Okay. Yeah, so do you say, don't. Don't say So there's a problem to say this bracha, because it's like saying, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm reformed. <laughs> that's basically what it says. It's a loss. Right. So what? Do, so what do you do? So what do you do? So really, when the other Rebbe wrote his sitter, he knew there was such a thing as Shasani Kiltana, but he didn't put it in. On the other hand, he also wanted. He writes in the Shulchan Aruch that women should should pray. They should say Shachris. So what did he want them to do? Okay, but you have to say the brachos. The brachos, even if you don't, even if you don't say the amida, you still should say the brachos. So what did he want people to? What did he want women to say? So the Rav, many years ago, he raised this theory. Which Rav? Rav Ginsburg. He had this idea, and I think it's 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 a very deep idea. And he says that women should say the same bracha. Well, 
שלא עשה אני אישה. כן, that it's the same bracha, because really what does it mean? It means that I'm active, I'm proactive, I'm not, I'm not passive. Because that's really what it means. I, I, even in the, in the time of the sages, they already had such a distinction. They used to say, Nashim shelanu chashuvotin. That our women are important. They're not like the women of the past. The women of the past, they were passive. They were not important in the sense that they did not affect reality. But our women, they, not only do they affect reality, maybe they're the main force of moves reality. Even already in the time of the Talmud, there's this phrase, Nashim shelanu shani. Our women are different. How are they different? They affect reality. So a way to get out of, out of the problem that people have with understanding masculine and feminine is to say that the masculine is every human being once he assumes a position of of, of, of affecting reality. And the feminine that I wed, that I want to convince to marry me, is reality. Now this goes a long way to explaining also the, the, the modern, call it almost, um, it can become negative, but there's also a positive element to it, the modern infatuation with career. The question is, what are you talking about when you say a career? If you're just talking about somewhere where I go to work and they pay me at the end of the month, and I want to rise higher and higher. So all you're interested in is, is, your, is your sustenance, so that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about more that a person invests himself in building something that becomes, like many, uh, when it's not done the right way, so many women will say, well, it's like you have a mistress. It's like you have another wife. But it should be true about women as well. They also have another wife. <laughs> they also have a wife. Who's their wife? So it could be that she chooses. That my wife, my, wife my, my project is my home. And that's my business. That's, that's what I'm going to develop. It could be that she also wants something more. But in the end, I'm taking my cue from the Rebbe, for whom a Chabad house has, like they call it today, co-directors. You don't say the husband and wife even. <laughs> It's like this is a very forward-thinking type of thing, right? That every Chabad house has two directors. Well, it happens to be the one's male and one's female, and they happen to be also married. But the point is that they're co-directors. They're, they're, they're both invested in this project. So to be invested in a project, to be invested in reality, is to be its male, to be its husband. And I have to convince reality to come and join me and put its faith in me, the faith it origi- originally has, that it will turn out to be good. What's it? Who are you trying to convince? Who is reality. reality. Who is reality? Whatever you're, you're engaged in. Okay. It could be... You want to start a thing. Okay. Let's, let's say you want a clinic now. A clinic? So that's who you're marrying. And that becomes your feminine. And you have to convince it the way, and you have to treat it with respect and loyalty, the same way that you would treat your wife if you were a man, or if you would treat your husband if you were a woman. With regard Hashem and our relationship, Hashem's masculine, we're feminine. Right. This is the switch of that. How do we reconcile it? It's just a different facet. It's a different facet altogether. Hashem is investing in us. We're investing in reality. What's another aspect of this? That we call it Pratsuf Rachel. Okay, the, the persona of Rachel, which is the persona of, of Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael is like, a, is like a woman. What does the Navi say? Ki valuch banaich. That your children will procreate with you. It's, that's exactly what it's called. That your children, meaning the children of Israel, the Jewish people, it's like they have intercourse with you. They, they become your husband. And there it certainly doesn't differentiate between male and female. Whether you're a Jew, you're a, a, a male Jew or a female Jew, it's the same thing. The land of Israel is built the same way that you build a woman. 
The same way that you would invest in anything feminine to build it up. To invest in it means to care for it, to be loyal to it, to take care of it. <laughs> I don't know how to say it more than that, but it's like to look at its needs. What are your needs? That might be so much confusion because there is this energy happening out there, it's just not being channeled in the right way. And people are channeling it into sexual relationships. Right. This gender, it's a gender. Right, it's right, a right, 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 mm. right. That's right. not because there is this right. happening. Right. Uh-huh. And it's also because uh-huh. we have been stripped of our ability to devote ourselves to a feminine cause, if you want. And because there is such a thing as the feminine rising, so then there becomes this thing that, what do you mean, the feminine doesn't need you? But no, you have to look at it now, that both men and women, whatever your sex is, or whatever your physical sex is, have to be wedded, not much like, like wedded in, in matrimony to some cause. And that you can't find yourself in today's world if you don't have that. Yeah. There's a question on what you said earlier about Rabbi Meir and Bruri are being a tikkun for Yosef and Asna. Mm. So Asna seems like her life is a tremendous tikkun. She comes from Shem and Dina and then she becomes the mother right, right, right. of Ephraim and Menashe, the wife of Yosef. Well, Bruri comes to such a tragic ending. It's yeah. hard to see how it could be like a tikkun in that direction. Okay, so... The, the, question, the question really is about the relationship that, uh, that she has with, uh, with Yosef. Okay. The, the hint here is that the word trust is batach. Right? That's the root. Bet tetchet. What does tetchet mean? So we, I think we mentioned this a few times, but it comes from the verse, vetach et abayt, like tiach. Tiach is the plaster. Right, so we said that. But the sages use this word, latuach, to also mean the procreative act. Specifically, the insemination. That's what they call it. And the... the the image is not so hard to understand. The whiteness in both is what's, uh, is what's uh, driving this image. And that it's as if the womb is a chamber that the insemination plasters. Okay? And then something can begin to build inside. But that's only the tet and chet. What does the bet stand for? So the sages say that If you want to ensure that all your children are male, male, I'm using this word now, and and understand what's going to happen to it now. If you want to ensure that all your children are male, you inseminate once and then again. It says, bet tach. Two times tach. In our context, what this means is, if you want to give birth to offspring, that have trust, that, that they're male, they're masculine, regardless of what their sexual uh, orientation is. Again, it would have, no, not gender. Regardless of what their physical sex is. Whether it's a girl or a boy, I want them to have trust in Hashem. I want them to be proactive. I want them to go and stake their place in reality to make it the way Hashem wants it to be. So you always, even when a Gilgul is perfect already, there's still a need for a repetition of it. Because they don't have the truth. No, because you need two times in order to make it fully masculine to make the offspring fully masculine. In fact, what's their first child called? Osnat and Yosef. Menashe. Menashe. What does that mean? 
suffering. Yeah, but what word is that from? What what word comes from that? Comfort. Isha. Isha. Girl. Okay. Menashe, that's why we say Nashim, and we don't say uh, Ishot. Ishot <laughs> means many fires. <laughs> Nashi means many women. Why? Because the word woman comes from forgetfulness. The same way that that feminine, nekeva, comes from what? From a hole. Hole with an H, not WH. There's something lacking. To forget means that there's something missing. What's missing? According to this point of view, what's missing is the ability to take action. Is the ability to trust. And exactly what did we say? Where is the ability to trust? Where is it? It's in foundation. It's all around foundation, all around the sphere of foundation, which is the sexual organs. So it's either concave or convex. If it's protruding, Right, then it's going out there and doing something. If it's the opposite, like it's, it's forgetfulness, it's, it's something missing, that's what it looks like, so it's, it's passive, and not able to change reality. But what about in Torah, Miriam, Devorah? I said, oh, so yeah, we have to see, how did they get to that stage yeah. where there are already women that are, that are completely uh, active? Dvorah is, the, is one of the strongest examples. <laughs> Especially, what's a Dvorah known for? For two things. It's, first of all, it's sweetened. Like it knows how to sweeten and it knows how to make honey. Yeah. But the other thing is it's sting. Yeah, that's the other thing a, 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 a Dvorah is known for. So the, there's, in Dvorah, there's a lot of sting. She's very. <laughs> she's also Givua, but, but the Gimel and Dawid also interchange sometimes. But she's a very uh, straightforward and shoot to the point type of type of person, mm-hmm. and she was married to Barak. She was actually her her husband, and she doesn't uh, save any of her criticism from him <laughs> about how he went about the war and so on and all these things. So she's very uh, she's very uh, what do you call it. Zedel, so you can make mistakes also the second time. But it's not because of what happened in the first. At least I don't remember that the Arizal says it's to it's to make up for the first. And it could be that it's something that's in the second. It's a terrible mistake. So also this crazy test from two such high people. That the whole so all, all, the all these things with uh, <laughs> with these great people is always some uh, some problem like this. Um, still there's something important that happens. When the Arizo says that the feminine rises, he doesn't mean that it becomes masculine. It's not that suddenly there are no, there's no masculine and feminine. You're still, there's still masculine and feminine. I mean, the reality is still feminine. It's an actual feminine, even when it rises higher. The same thing between human beings. Even if I take the biological sex, the, the male and the female, so the female retains the biological sex, she still has to re- remain feminine. What's that for? So the Rizal says, eventually she rises higher than the male. To face the male. How, what, do, what does that mean in, in our context? It means that because, you could say almost because of all this trust, the male eventually extinguishes himself. He overdoes it. What? His attempts to change reality. He goes too far. What's the example? That Rabbi Akiva tried with uh, Bar Kochba, for instance, and he failed. How does the Rambam describe this? He says somebody who's a kosher individual and tries to change reality, tries to, tries to bring the redemption, and is for whatever reason unsuccessful and he's killed, meaning he dies, he's not successful in his attempt, Th- this is what we call Mashiach ben Yosef. 
The Rambam doesn't say Mashiach bin Yosef. He never mentions these words. But he says that he's like a kosher king from the Jewish people. What does that mean? He's a kosher king from the Jewish people. Same way that there were the kings of Israel. The kings of Israel were mostly from the house of Ephraim. Mostly from Yosef. So that's what the Medrash calls a Mashiach bin Yosef. And then we have the Gemara in Sukkah that says that all the Mashiachim ben Yosef, they're destined to die on duty. They're not able to fulfill their mission without extinguishing themselves. Meaning there's, there's, a, there's inherently a tremendous danger in having trust. Not that Hashem won't help you, but it's called bitachon mufraz. The, Mufraz, Mufraz is overbearing too much, to, has, without end. Because this whole power is called the power of the infinite. Actually, bitachon, if you understand what it means, if it's connected to foundation, it's the power of the infinite in man. It's not just to give birth to children, which is called the power of the infinite, that I can give birth to something to create new life. That's the power of the infinite. That's what Hashem does. But it's also in these endeavors that I take upon myself that I want to inseminate reality. I want to see my vision carried out. So I have a tendency to have too much trust. And again, it's not even trust in myself. That for sure. The, you can see right away with confidence that we talked about the early confidence that a child has that that certainly is, goes into overconfidence. And that's why it breaks. Because in trust, inherently, there's this infinite power. So the moment you begin to trust in yourself, as a child or as a teen, you have infinite trust. You're not supposed to trust in yourself, are you? And even when you fix it, and you begin to trust in Hashem, not in yourself, there's still this element of, of trust being overbearing being too strong. What, what is, what, what's the, the simple example? Again, from insemination, the sages say that, that if, it ins, if it's not shooting like an arrow, it doesn't give birth. What do you mean? Why do you need to shoot like an arrow? <laughs> it goes in. What, what, what's this whole thing? Because that shooting, that, that power that's inherent in it, that shows that it's alive. But when it's alive, it, it overdoes it. It always overdoes it. And if you remember, there's a beautiful, beautiful image of this between David and Yonatan. Mm -hmm. That when David is running away from Shaul, and Yonatan comes to tell him whether he can join the uh, Rosh Chodesh meal or not, whether Shaul still wants to kill him or not, so the sign between them is that, that, that Yonatan will... will will shoot an arrow, shoot arrows, and if they fall short of David, so you should know that he can't... Uh, but if they pass him, so he'll know that he can come back. Okay? So this whole image, Yonatan here is like the uh, masculine, and David is the, the feminine. Yeah. He's shooting arrows at him. <laughs> so he says, if I have enough strength to shoot it beyond you, so that means everything is okay, so come. So that's, the, that's the, one of the interesting images that goes with this. It's also, how does it, what is it called? It's called, Ki mitachavei kashet. Mitachavei comes from the word tet, tet it's the same thing. Mitachavei, the shooting of an arrow. So it's by definition, it's always too far. But that's how the foundation is. That's how trust is. It's built into it. If it's alive, it shoots far. It can't shoot close. It doesn't work that way. So there's, first of all, something a person has to get used to. That even when I trust, in, certainly when I trust in myself, I'm going to overdo it. But even when I trust in Hashem, it's very difficult for me to stop on time. And I, I try to do too much. It's just built in, because the moment you start going, you start going. And again, it, you're trusting in Hashem, you're not trusting in yourself. It still doesn't matter, it's the same problem. It's the same issue. So what does it mean that reality goes higher than you? 
Is that, that, so really what the Rizal is saying, that's how, that's how it's explained, reality is reality out. saves you from yourself. Right? Reality comes about and it puts the limits on you. Mm-hmm. Not letting you move as quickly as you'd like to and saying, wait a minute, I'm going to call the shots. Can pun intended. That is going to tell you how far to shoot. Or it's going to stop your arrows before they become detrimental to yourself. So reality puts a break on you. So let me read a question here. There's a few things, which I haven't read yet. Gulan wrote, Each forefather seems to have had the same challenge in their own way. Okay. And then he wrote, Learning about one's limits is important, but so we draw the lines where our wives want us to. You got it before I said, you wrote this before. Or push out further towards potential. Okay. So really, when you're married to reality... If you're just here to abuse it, there are no limits, and it doesn't get to say anything, like you ignore it, and eventually you'll kill yourself. But to be married to it is also to listen to what it's telling you. It's telling me something. And then Miriam Weed wrote, So Rabbi Akiba was able to return from Pardes unscathed, was the one who back in this world failed in this manner. So I'm not, not sure what she meant, so maybe she'll clarify, I wasn't able to follow. In any case, so now we have that reality going higher than, or the feminine eventually going higher than the masculine, means that there has to be some cap on the power of trust, as it were. It means that the vessel has to be ready to receive before the arrow can be shot. And, and that's where the, the loyalty to, the, to reality comes into play. Don't shoot the arrow until you're certain, that, the, or, or not that you're certain, but that there is we'll call it a sign again, but this time the sign is completely different, that reality is a willing receptor to you. Like Remember, taking a bit of initiative in a way. That's what it means, that it rises higher. Right. Okay. And that's why it says that in the end, Mashiach ben David saves Mashiach ben Yosef from dying. So let's give a story that will really uh, illustrate this. And two people that we know were Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David in their generation were the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, and his main disciple, Rav Chaim Vital, Rechu. Rizal told him, he revealed to him, to Rav Chaim Vital, that I'm Mashiach ben Yosef and you're Mashiach ben David. And he said, you have to pray very hard that I don't die. <laughs> What did he mean? So Rav Chaim Vital writes in his memoirs, he writes that the Arizal had Mesirut Nefesh on revealing the secrets of the Zohar. The Arizal had, was willing to sacrifice himself to reveal the secrets of the Zohar. What did he do? He was told from Shemaim not to reveal certain secrets of Chaim Vital. And they told him that if you reveal this, you'll pay with your son. He had, he had a few sons. The Rizal was told from Shemaim not to reveal some secret. But then he went ahead and did it anyway. Because it says that more than the, more than the calf wants to suckle, the, the cow wants to give its milk. Mm-hmm. But it's not just a natural thing. He had, he had self-sacrifice on it. He said, 
what do you mean? <laughs> My son, we'll see. Maybe the min nashamayim rachamu, exactly what Rabbi Yochanina ben Taradion did. Same thing, min nashamayim rachamu. Though I have mercy in heaven, I have to do my thing. I can't uh, forego it because they tell me it's dangerous. But that's exactly what happened. He revealed the secret, and a few weeks later, the son passed away in a fever. After that, he came to Rachut or Rav Chaim Vital and told him, "You have to pray for me that I don't die because I'm a Shiach ben, because I am a Shiach ben Yosef, and Mashiach ben Yosef doesn't know his limits." What do you mean? He doesn't know his limits. He will continue with his trust in God. Mean Hashemayim Rachamu. That's trust in God, but it's bitachon mufraz. It's overbearing trust. Did you say uh, Rafan Vital was then Moshiach ben David? Right. What does Moshiach ben David do? He prays. Moshiach ben Yosef gives the Torah. And Moshiach ben David, he's the vessel. He's the kli. What makes a kli? What changes, what makes the vessel in reality? What makes reality ready for the great teachings that are coming? Prayer. That's how it goes together. Torah and tefillah. Torah is the yesod. It's tiferet and yesod. Yaakov Yosef. And tefillah is David. V'ani tefillah, says David. So the Mashiach ben Yosef, he's all Torah, like the Ari here, the teacher. And the student is the Mashiach ben David. What's the student's role? He doesn't have to prepare a shir, so he has plenty of time. So one of the things the students don't know, <laughs> that the shir is only as good as how much you pray before. Right? The, the Rebbe has to give the shir. He doesn't have time to daven in length. But I, the student, have all the time in the world because I, I just sit there and, and it's given to me for free. I didn't have to work for it. So what's my work? How do I contribute to this whole thing? I create the vessel. I create the vessel inside myself and inside of reality through prayer. And when you think about it, that's the classical picture of what male and female is, that the male would study Torah and the woman would daven. Did you also say that there are those type of men that are more David type um, person that are in their essence and more Come, come, come. But, 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 so first, uh, we started out with me trying to change the whole masculine feminine uh, dialectic to talk about us in reality. Now I'm coming back to it being us, but instead of being us as male and female again, sexually, I'm rather talking about the relationships that we have. That in a place where I'm a receiver, my task is to pray. Is, to, is to, to create the vessel through prayer. In the places where I'm the giver, I'm the one who's giving, I'm like Mashiach ben Yosef. So my task is to give the Torah, to give the, the, the seed. And in every relationship, I'm something else. Okay? It's also one of the things that, uh, that people have a... If I, if I could go far enough to say that yeshiva students don't know what their role is. Okay? But it's because, you know, you could say that the whole, the whole uh, Mishagas today in the world with gender started from the yeshivas. Yeah, it could have. Yeah. Why? <laughs> because what's the role of a student? What's his role? What should he be doing most of the day? Just receiving. Receiving. Where did, he, where did this come about to suddenly... The student is supposed to give the, you know, learn and beforehand everything. He can't. The, the great thing about Rav Soloveitchik, for instance, was that he had an ongoing shear in, in, at YU, and they would go through pretty much a, a, an amud a day, but it was a long shear. They had to prepare for it. I don't know how many hours it prepared, but they had time left over. Because you couldn't, maybe you're trying to show yourself off. Like you're the, as good as the teacher. You can't be as good as the teacher. If you're as good as the teacher, you, you go sit in front and you tell us what, what, what it says. I'm not saying you have to dumb down. But you have to know that your real role is to pray for his success. 
if the, if the relationship is a healthy one, so I don't try to take his place. This is not like you don't have to have an Oedipal complex. It's one of the, one of the terrible things that I've heard time and again from, uh, from really big Tamidei Chachamim is that they're thankful that there is, it's hard to say, but they're thankful that people grow old and die. Why? Because then they can take their place. <laughs> I've heard this from Mamish, like the, what are you talking about? <laughs> If I have a teacher that I love and respect and I want to learn from him, I want to learn from him to now till the end of time. Why would I want to take his place? Uh, but that's how the world is built today. Yes. So my real task is to pray, is to create the vessel. And, and then he won't go so far, as like the Ari said, to overextend himself, to, to shoot too far and eventually die from it and not be able to continue, because he, he takes on too much. But the prayer mitigates the, the Right, the prayer is me rising above him, as it were. Okay? And then With the pr- power of prayer. It says, Ad David Gdil. Finally, when Yonatan and David met in the field, they cried one on the shoulders of the other, until it says, Ad David Gdil. Until David was above Yonatan. So even though Yonatan was shooting the arrows, in the end, David with his prayer is higher. What does it mean? That it, like you said, it mitigates it. It says there's a cap on what you do. Or at least I'm extending the vessel so that there's room for everything that you're giving. Okay. If um, the Ari the Ari and Khan Vital were being the two Moshiachs, why did they not bring the Messianic era at that time? So, first of all, I think that he means it relatively speaking. Meaning he's saying, I relative to you were like the Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. But certainly the teachings that the Arizal is revealing are the teachings of Mashiach. That's certainly the Pneumius of the Torah, the inner dimension of Torah, which is what Mashiach reveals. So even though he wasn't, um, it's hard to even see exactly in that political scenario what in the world could they have done, but they set the ball rolling down this hill that's called the redemption, because you know everything has been moving, whether you come from the Hasidic world or from the Graz world, from the Gaon of Vilna's world, or even more so if you come from, from the Sephardi world, what's been pushing <laughs> the last 500 years is the Arizal Torah. That's what's been pushing everybody. In, in every, in a, you're saying the beginning was really Rabbi Akiva. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Akiva is a classic example of a Mashiach ben Yosef. Eventually he dies because of his uh, He didn't say But he has the same attitude I'll go and teach Torah And it doesn't matter what the Romans say and so on, so on, so on. When he dies, isn't King David supposed to kick in? Mashiach no, there was no, there was no King David To his, king, to his Mashiach ben Yosef at the time He thought Bal Kokhva would be But apparently he wasn't So right, we're not going to know who it is Okay So, so this is a um, In the end, the result of all of this is that this is how the feminine assumes trust. We said before that she's only faith. She becomes full of trust through rising above the male. She becomes the crown of the male, like Atered Bala. To say it in other words, that, and this is simple, now, now we're going back into the stereotypes, that the masculine is innately full of trust, which begins with self-trust or self-confidence, and has to be rectified by becoming confidence in God, trust in Hashem, in God we trust. The feminine begins with faith in God. Wait, masculine... Trust and, has to... and we said that faith is like being empty. It's like emptying myself entirely of, of my whole self. It's complete, it's, I think we would say it in another way, we'd say it's complete self-nullification. Like, uh, like Avram when he says, Hen li lo, that yes for me is like no, it's all the same. Because it doesn't matter, I don't get to uh, decide. So now, the fulfillment of each one is to assume the other's character trait. 
So the masculine has to acquire faith, and that's its hardest thing, <laughs> to nullify itself to the point where it has faith in God, not confidence. And the feminine has to acquire confidence, trust in Hashem. How does the feminine acquire the trust? Through prayer. That's the idea here. But those guys, By going above... In the Torah, they're also praying all day. No, they're not praying all day. Trust me, they're not. Well, two times a day. It's very rare. And to say it another way... The Arizal saw, or how did he become the successor, say in something that hopefully we'll get to see soon. When you go to the Baal Shem Tov's shul, there's a very interesting feature there. In the back there's a small room. In the shul. Who lived in that room? So hopefully everybody knows that the Magid of Mezrich who was a Baal Shem Tov's successor, he lived in that room. It's in the shul itself. It's just a back room in the shul. It's not so big, but it's, it's a room. He could live there. And it says that he was there all day long, davening. So how did he become the Baal Shem Tov's successor? Because as a student, what he did was, he was the biggest davener. Nobody davened like him. So when the Baal Shem Tov, when the, when the Mashiach ben Yosef of that generation passed away, so who took his role? The person who created the biggest vessel for him. But then he began to teach. And who took his, his light? So there were many, but apparently, cause many, apparently many of them davened well. So they had 60 or 120 successors. But the person who davened apparently the hardest and the strongest, he's the one who became the main successor. So you can say the same thing about the Arizal, that if you know this, all of the Arizal's Kabbalah is really to teach us how to daven. That's why among the Mikubalim today, there's two types of, uh, there's two types of uh, jobs. There's the Mikubalim and there's the Mechavnim. The Mikubalim are the ones who know it's Chaim in the intellectual sense. Any, any, anything that you need to, to know, to, to ask, they know where to find it. And they understand it. But the big, the really big ones, the ones that are considered greater, are the ones who daven with the Eitz Chaim, meaning they daven with all the Kavanot. And that's called a Mechavin. But it's in davening specifically. So if you go through the Arizal, you see that everything he's, he's thinking about the whole time is how to daven. <laughs> Where did he get that from? So I'm assuming, I haven't seen this written, but I'm just assuming a person, a person injects himself and, he, and, he, and he, he invests himself and he explains things according to the thing he's spent the most time doing, where he's preoccupied. So before the Ramak passed away, the Rizal, what he was doing, he was davening all the time. It says he was a lot of, a lot of time in meditation. He had a small, it says he, has, he had also a small hut on the Nile, and they used to spend days and weeks there, all the time, just uh, meditating. So meditating, what does it mean? You daven, what does you do? What do you do? It's like you're in the middle of davening, and you begin to think, and you think, and you think, and you think. So he apparently became the Ramax, Rav Moshe Cordovero's successor, because he was the one who prayed the most. Okay, so this sort of brings us to a, a certain closure on, uh, on Emunave Bitachon as it is here. Well, maybe we'll revisit some other things. Now what I want to get into is Chovot uh, Alvavot. Okay. Which is duties of the heart. Duties of the heart from Rabbeinu B'chayi. And I took a translation from the internet. You can find it easily. You just put in duties of the heart and gate of trust. So let's read it. Let's try to read it. But this is still, if trust is confidence, we are still talking about confidence. 
Ken, Ken, it's the same thing. Trust and confidence are just synonyms. Use them interchangeably. So this is a little bit into the introduction. Okay. And in the introduction, he, he sets out seven things that need to be in a person that you trust. He says, what, what causes me to trust somebody? And then he says, how, and then the next part, which is what we're going to read from, actually not what we're going to read from, then the next part is that he says, how do these seven things apply to Hashem? And then he gets into, what do I need in order to be, to have trust, to have trust in Hashem? What character traits do I need? So he said that in order to explain these character traits, he has to give a few introductions. So we're now going to read the fifth introduction. <laughs> okay. So this is somewhat into it, but again, if you, want, if you read it from the beginning, you'll see that he's very clear, he's very, he builds it very nicely. It's like he spent a lot of time on, on this book. So the reason I'm bringing this is because it's, it's so much one of the main things that people struggle with when it comes to trust. And again, the, the, the main, you could say, dilemma about trust is, well, if you trust Hashem to do what you want, then what do you need to contribute, if anything? In fact, people think, everybody's familiar with the famous joke, right, that it's meant to belittle trust, which says that the guy is on a, right, uh, surrounded by water, and uh, he wants to, he's on top of his house because there's a flood, and he wants to be saved, so he calls out to Hashem, and the helicopter comes and says, no, no, Hashem, I want you to save me, and so on. And that's how, that's one of the ways to belittle it, to say, no, no, trust, again, is after the fact. It's not before the fact. Because before the fact, it'll never be Hashem. It'll always be something else. So don't trust in Hashem, just, uh, just accept whatever, whatever happens. What was it, what is, what is it trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you to trust in Hashem. People imagine, what does that mean? That Hashem should sh- somehow show you that He's picking you up out of here and moving you. So apply it to Parnassah, for instance. So if I trust in Hashem, what should I be able to do? I should sit at home and have money. And money will come pouring out of the walls. Right? If, if I trust in Hashem, if trust in Hashem means that Hashem will do what I want, then that's what it should mean. And everybody knows that that doesn't work. Well, almost everybody. For some people it doesn't work, so then they don't know that it doesn't work. <laughs> but for most of us that doesn't work. So why is it that even though you should have trust, why is it that you should still have what we call ishtadlut, still contribute to what Hashem is going to give you? Okay, that's what this introduction is about. And the reason that it's interesting is because it, it, it places the, whole, the word siba that we've talked about so much about, about circumstances, right? Mm-hmm. Sibot, in a completely different light. Okay, but there's a, there's an, there's a lot more to learn here in, the, in, in, in duties of the heart. But we'll start with this. So he calls this, A person should realize, this is really the fifth introduction. I don't know why the fifth introduction fell, but it says... Is this five of seven, or is it the fifth introduction that's coming before the seven? It's the fifth introduction that's coming before. (laughs) A person should realize that every new thing that happens in, in this world after creation is completed, meaning fulfilled in two ways. In two ways, what does he mean? Not in two possible ways, but two things are required to fulfill anything that's happening now in the world. Wait, before we continue, let me see what what they wrote here. So Miriam tried to explain what she said. She said, the four who entered Pardes, I take that to be an encounter with the infinite. And only Rabbi Akiva went in peace and came out in peace. So he seems to have known how to interact properly, safely with the infinite. Are you 
And yet with Bar Kokhba, he went too far in field. So, so we, we, this I talked about in a previous class, I think even this week. Uh, yes, on Sunday, we talked about what it means to prepare... Sunday? No. We talked about it here? When, when did they talk about what it means to prepare the... Sh- oh, I talked about it in Shul on Shabbos, so that wasn't taped. Uh, what it means to prepare the Shov before you do the Ratzo. So, okay, maybe not now. It's a whole topic in and of itself. How Rabbi Akiva did that in the Pardis and why he didn't do it with Bar Kochva. Okay. But certainly that the fact that he failed with Bar Kochva was an example of Mashiach ben Yosef dying. That he has too much in him, too much confidence in Hashem, bitachon mufraz, and eventually, if he's not prayed for, it ends uh, not so well. Golan writes, can we say that the law itself during the times of the Mashiach unravels and restriction through rectification of the physical limitations that we suffer? To a certain extent, yes, that's exactly what Mashiach is going to do. That hutra retzua, it says that the, that, the, uh, that the whip with which Hashem restricts reality is, is hung up on the, on the wall and we don't use it anymore. Okay. So, when he says here that everything after creation, after Hashem finished his creation, so from then on, his decree is, Asher barai lukim la'asot, that Hashem created things in a way, from now on, that they would be la'asot. It would be too complete, letaken, as Rashi says. So says Rabbeinu Bechayi, that everything after creation has to be completed with two elements to it. First, by God's de- decree and His will that the matter should come into existence. Secondly, through intermediate causes and means, some near, some remote, some apparent, some hidden, all of which rushed to bring into existence what was decreed, doing so with God's help. What was the first one you said? So first of all, it's what Hashem decrees, that He wants it to be this way. Hu amar he says, he decreed, this is how it will be. But when he said, when Hashem added that this is the way that it will be done from now on, it means that there are causes. There are now some intermediates that have to come together with the decree. I Meaning the decree is not complete by itself usually. Okay? Causes? Yeah. So he calls them causes. Sibot, exactly what causes. we call them. Remember, we said sibot in... in when you don't yet have confidence, when you're only working on rectifying the ego, or after your initial confidence fails, and so you fall down into a small state of faith. We said Noah is a small state of faith. And even when Hashem tells him, go and build me an ark, <laughs> and put all the animals in and go into it, in the end, Noah is not willing to enter the ark until the waters force him to enter the ark. And the sages call that small, small faith or minor faith. Why? Because after you've lost your confidence in yourself, and you've come to have faith in God, which really means that you're not proactive, Hashem has to move you all the time. So then even to do the smallest thing, you come to Hashem and you say, show me a sign. Anything that you want me to do, Hashem, show me a sign. Okay? If you don't show me a sign, and we said those are sibot in, in small, in minor faith. But here, sibot, katnut emuna, noach mi katnei amanahaya. It's the minor faith that he has, and in the minor faith, we said that's that's where most of us are are holding before we learn about trust and confidence, before before we learn the, the, this thing. The, where are we? So we failed in, uh, in, in becoming uh, what we thought we'd become. So now, if you want me, Hashem, to do something, you better show me a pretty clear sign that this is what you want me to do. Otherwise, I don't want to hear about it. Every person in his failures, whatever my failure has been. So my failure was with uh, school. So now if Hashem wants me to get involved in the school, you better show me a huge, huge you know, billboard that says, go get involved in this school. I don't, I don't want to, otherwise, I don't want to hear about it. No, not to, to, <laughs> it's really a failure. I have no connection to it anymore. <laughs> so that's how it works. Maybe. So maybe you do it once, you do it twice, you do it three times. Eventually, your failures leave you in a place where you say, "This is not for me." I, Hashem, you want me to do this? <laughs> you got to show me something really clear. That small faith. 
And then the causes... So why did I do it the first time? So my answer is I did it because of my confidence in myself. <laughs> right? That's why. But even that has a echo of what my true shlichut is. Except that it's unrectified still. That my trust, with, my confidence was in myself and not in Hashem. So, th- so it's going to come around at some point. The question is when? When am I going to grow up enough to understand that the thing that I failed and I still will have to pursue it? There's no way around it. So they'll come. So they'll come back in another Gilgul and do it then. <laughs> Some way. <laughs> Meaning to say it another way that when that thing is successful, if they're rectified, they will feel tremendous joy that this was actually finally done, whatever this thing was. If this wasn't theirs, and they're not rectified, then they'll feel like, why did I give up on it? I should have pursued it. Look how successful this thing is. But if it's really yours and you're rectified, so you say, settled. the mitzvah was done by somebody else, I don't care. As long as it was done. So it's still connected to me. Even if I failed, even if I wasn't the one to perform the mitzvah. Settled. but the mitzvah was done, that's all. That's all I'm interested in, really. Sometimes when someone can bring it down into this world, someone else may bring it through all the way. Uh-huh. Nahon. Nahon. That we said about the moments, right? That we said for for certain is true in the moments of of death, when a person is approaching death, the question of whether his projects, his mission in life, will be completed through his children, through other people, depends on how much he's able to hold on to it through those moments, how much he's able to continue focusing on that mission. And it's still possible to, to complete it, but it's just going to be completed by other people. Okay. okay. So, getting back to Rabbeinu Bechai. So he here uses the word cause in a completely different way. He's now saying that the cause, a siba, is not a sign, the way we explained it when you have small faith, minor faith. Rather, the cause is now an active participation by something else. It's like Hashem, is, it's also His decree, but His decree was that there have to be other um, contributions to make this happen. Now, there's a big principle in halacha that doesn't exist in the, in the, in the non, non-halachic world, because it doesn't make too much sense. And this is where people get hung up on this sentence. In halacha, we have a principle that says, Ziva Zegorim. What is Ziva Zegorim? It means that there are two contributors to a result. And each one is fully responsible. In the regular world, let's say we lift a table together, me and somebody else. Okay? So each one of us can be said to have contributed half of the table being lifted up. We can't say that I have complete responsibility for the table being lifted up and that the other person also has complete responsibility. There's no such thing. But in Allah, that's how it works. Zev gorim, cause. Two causes for the same result. Two equally responsible causes for the same result. Of course there can be many causes that lead to one result, because each one contributed something else. But to say that, even though they contributed, they can even contribute, contribute different things, we hold them still fully responsible. Now, if you go into, into, into legal, into Roman law, or English law, whatever it is, there's no such thing. You can't hold two people equally responsible for the same crime. One person sold him the gun, the other person shot. <laughs> okay, you can't say they're both equally responsible. So you, you shouldn't have sold him the gun, but you didn't kill the person. But in Allah, there is such a thing. I'm not saying that in this case it would be that way. But there are many things in Hilchus Shabbos that are that way. Okay. 
So now, what he means here is that Hashem's decree and the causes that need to be added to the decree are equally responsible. They're not just another contribution. <laughs> okay? So Miriam, who's a lawyer, says it's true in law in general. So you'll have to explain to me why it's true in law in general. It's definitely not true in physics. And I was also told that, that lawyers are physicists at heart and that they don't accept this uh, principle. So maybe, you know, she'll explain to me later why it's true in law also. Okay. An illustration of the causes. Consider the act of drawing up water from the depths of the, of the earth using a wheel system. Why does he talk about a wheel system? Because it's a good example of, of grama, of... No, co-conspirators is something else. That's not what I meant. Okay, she writes that it's co-conspirators. It's a different principle. It's not ziva ziggling. Because they're not, they can't, they're not responsible independently. They're only responsible together. Meaning that they contributed together. Here, um, it means that each one is responsible separately and it could be for different acts that contributed separately to the result. Okay. Consider the act of drawing up water from the depths of the earth using a wheel system which, to which buckets are attached and which raise the water from the well. The buckets are the near cause. What do I mean by near cause? That they're the closest to the water. They're what actually the water goes into. The remote cause is a man who harnessed an animal to the wheel and compels the animal to move in order to raise the water from the bottom of the well to the surface of the earth. The intermediate means between the man and the buckets are the animal, the mechanical contraption of interconnected wheels, gears, which churn each other in series, and the rope. If a mishap were to occur to any one of the causes mentioned, the intended purpose for which they were designed would not be accomplished. And so it is for the other things which come to existence. They cannot be produced by a man or anyone else, but rather through the decree of God, and he is preparing all the means for which the thing will be produced, as written, and by him causes are counted. What does he want to say? The verse is, Velonit kenu alilot. Alilot, alul, this is where the word alul, which is like siba comes from, that Hashem prepared causes. He's preparing all the means through which the thing will produce. Okay? Sorry. And it was a cause from a God. And uh, like it says, oh, There the verse is something else. And if the means are blocked, none of the actions which normally bring this matter into existence will succeed. When we examine the need for a man to pursue means and exert himself to complete his needs, we can see with our own eyes that for one who needs food and proper food is served before him, if he does not exert himself to eat it by lifting the food to his mouth, chewing it, etc., he will not break his hunger. Likewise, for someone thirsty who needs water. And all the more so if he has no food prepared until he needs to exert himself through milling, flour, kneading, baking, etc. And more so if he needs to buy the food and prepare it. And even more so still if he has no money to buy them, will need even greater exertion to pursue means to earn the money or to sell the amount he needs from the objects he uses or his other possessions or the like. Okay? This is all page one. Page one. Okay? You want a little break? It's also a lot to digest. Did you, okay. did you dab in Mincha? I dab in Mincha. I can say more to Helen. <laughs> Certainly always helps. Well, I think we should have a break for dogs. Okay, so we'll have a... What, what time is it anyway? I have no idea. Again. What time are you going until today? I don't know. What time is it? <laughs> 5 15. There's a lot of questions in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Did you pause this? Yeah. I'm looking for my son, a nice edition in Hebrew on Tanya, that gives an explanation, like the one in English that we have, that gives an explanation in Hebrew because he's Israeli, and would get him into learning, not too heavy, not too intellectual, but so the new one that Shilat put out is is like that. I'll bring it to you next time. I have it in the office. I don't need it, so you can. Uh... Yeah, they were passing it out for free everywhere around uh, Rosh Hashanah. So um, no, it's the first fifth, it's the first thirty something chapters, I think. Yeah. 
I'm looking for that right book. book. Yeah. 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 So I send it and it means to remind you. Yeah, remind me for next week. To, uh, okay, so whoever's on uh, Facebook, we're going to have a five minute break. And uh, sorry if you just joined, which some people have. And uh, we'll be back in five, God willing. Five whatever, five causes, five uh, something, five bananas. Yeah.